I primarily was a Californian. Yeah. Euphemistically, glamorously called Hollywood. <laughs> uh, indeed, there were uh, the New York actors, the shows that came out of New York in the golden days of radio were primarily of a documentary sense, and very often a more literate sense, very often a more substantial sense. Chicago was primarily a soap opera production center because the slaughterhouses in those days were in Chicago where the soap was being manufactured of animal fats. That's and interesting. That's exactly the reason for it. And the sponsors and the sponsors' wives who decided upon the artistic merits of any artist were in close proximity to the production. And Hollywood then, you see, uh, when I began in 35, just at that point, San Francisco was the big town on the coast. And uh, up to that point, uh, motion picture artists, motion picture performers were forbidden to appear on radio for fear they would lose their, their glamour. And since tickets cost 35 cents a piece to go to the motion pictures, there was a, a real problem until someone's nephew, I suppose, in one studio decided, let our actor, our movie star, step into your living room, and the phrase was born, and suddenly there became a vogue for motion picture actors. Now, the movie star was named and starred. He was the great glamorous attraction, and that's how Hollywood expanded into the glamour show. But those surrounding him were the workaday able actors who played part after part after part. The man you just heard is Hans Conried. In late 1943, he was 36 years old and all over radio. It was a marvelous time. I learned of happily I was able to sustain myself as an actor. I don't know what I should have done for a living. I would have had to learn something else. What about from the listener's standpoint? Do you think that I think uh, today's lost. young people I... have lost something? Well, I don't. I, 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 that's, you know, it's changing times, of course. The young people, I have four kids myself, and I know they have been educated or they have been entertained by the television screen. They have not read half the books at 20 that I read at 7 or 8, you know. They have not the literary background. They are in high school and college, and they are obliged to, but to read for pleasure, they don't. And uh, radio always seemed to me an extension of reading. Indeed, those of us who became radio actors must have enjoyed reading, or we would never have had the facility. When I tell you that at 16 or 17, or when I was 18 and became a professional actor, doing then what I'm doing now, some 35 years later... I was a pretty slick reader, and uh, indeed it was such a facility that was sometimes superficial because you very often gave your very best performance the first reading, mm. and you never felt that it was necessary to improve it. So there was that unfortunate aspect of it. But by and large, uh, we were a pretty slick bunch. There were many of us engaged in it. It was. It is hard to explain to persons who have never uh, utilized it as an evening's entertainment as we in our time did. But I suppose it was as avidly followed, and it caused as much social conversation, and certainly did, I suspect, rather less harm than the popular one that might as well be nameless now, in which I also make a living. It was a, a very rich theatrical form that has not been matched, I think, in many aspects by anything that has come later. When suspense moved to Hollywood, Conrad quickly became part of William Spears' trusted circle of character actors, often playing more than one part. He honed his craft in the 1930s. Boys. Most of us had that. It uh, enabled you to, to work more yeah. often. When I tell you that I worked for 50 cents a night and that apprenticeship was very valuable, there were only five of us doing a show. It was a very cheap carbon copy of a very successful show out of New York called March of Time. Mm -hmm. And we called it It Happened Today. And I remember in one 30-minute show, for which I was paid 50 cents and wasn't worth much more, I had to play 18 voices in 30 minutes. You know, you keep mentioning this, the craft which has all Well, it has, has been the lost, same facility say. now the, uh, and the same scope that being a dirigible pilot or a buggy whip <laughs> raider, you know. It was a craft. We knew did our work, and those of us, I think, I can say honestly, we felt then, and I can speak out now and say we were very good indeed, those of us who worked. They were pretty capable actors within their scope and sphere. To Bill Spears' credit, he did his best to allow them the time to have parts on other shows. I had probably the shortest rehearsals and the best actors I could get. I don't believe in throwing my weight around for two or three days and showing what an important man you are, screaming and that kind of thing. I never had any more than three or four hours rehearsal, I don't think. I was fortunate in having the very best actors. I've never run into any problems that I recall that were in any way worthy of the word problems. I was fortunate, as I say, to be able to hire, as regular members of the cast, the best actors I could find. and. In the March of Time days, for instance, 
My standing cast was Orson Welles, with whom I gave his first job when he was about 15 or 16 in radio, and Joseph Cotton and Van Heflin and Agnes Moorhead and Jeanette Nolan, John McIntyre, Ted DeCosha, Paul Stewart. In Hollywood, I had their equivalent. Some of them were even the same. John McIntyre and Jeanette Nolan would always work for me for scale. I never paid over scale, not that I was so penurious, but that I could not bear ever to feel that I was looking through the glass from the control room at one actor and knowing I was paying him more than another actor who was standing next to him. And so I just somehow never started the certain salary or extra pay system, and all who came to work for me worked for scale. They did, it is true, get awfully good roles, and they had brief rehearsals so that they were possible to make even a second show the same day. No, the actors never saw the scripts in radio, except for the stars, of course, who got their scripts a few days ahead so as to know what they were about. But radio, of course, was not the memorizing medium that television and the motion picture ends of the broadcasting business are concerned with. They never had the script until they arrived there. We'd sit at a table for maybe, well, however long it took to read it, 30 or 35 minutes. I'd make my notes. I'd tell them what I thought. We'd maybe break for 10 minutes for coffee or something. I'd go in the control room, and we would rehearse for the next two or three hours, and then we would do the show. Spears' rehearsals were known for their loose atmosphere. He selected the best radio actors to be part of the suspense troupe. This circle included Wally Mayer, Jeanette Nolan, Joseph Kearns, John McIntyre, and Loreen Tuttle. I always like to work with the top people. I'm not very good when I work with people who are not very good. <laughs> I'm just not. I like to work with people who are vibrant and know their business. I work a thousand times better if I have a challenge. I think it comes from being a Leo like I am. I just think, you know, because I'm a Leo, I just, I roar that way. Loreen Tuttle later worked with Spear on the adventures of Sam Spade. You know, he used to say such a cute thing. I used to ask questions on the show. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, on the rehearsal, uh, for real. Because I'm always saying, I don't understand this plot. I would always say to somebody, Howard or Bill Spear or somebody, I don't understand this plot. So they got to saying, down, Effie. Down, <laughs> Effie. And that's how that phrase got started. <laughs> it was down. a real thing, you know. Shut up, Effie. Spear had a habit of purposely going into a broadcast with a script that was a minute or two long, so the actors were forced into high tension. He wouldn't allow a studio audience, placing the orchestra behind the screen, out of sight of the cast, so that the actors could better concentrate on their performance. Suspense found sponsorship in the fall of 1943 with Roma Wines. The show moved to Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. The first sponsored episode was called The Black Curtain and starred Cary Grant. It's the first time listeners heard these phrases. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense, and radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Uniquely West Coast and Mountain Time would get a separate broadcast Monday, December 6th. This broadcast split would continue until September of 1944. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. The world toasts Roma, and Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for Roma Wines to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood... We are honored and happy to have with us one of the entertainment world's most distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Cary Grant. The suspense play which stars Cary Grant and which is produced and directed by William Spear is the exciting and tense bestseller by Cornell Woolrich called The Black Curtain. Suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with the Black Curtain and with the performance of Cary Grant, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense!
We sold the show to the Milton Bio Advertising Agency for its client, Roma Wines. And Cary Grant was the first star. I was fortunate in being able to immediately, practically, establish suspense as the elite show in the movie world. There was not an important actor from Paul Muni to Claude Rains to Cary Grant to everyone that possibly was, to Rosalind Russell and Betty Davis and all of the biggest stars wanted to be on suspense as a prestige thing and a show that they knew that they could be shown in a good light with and get a chance to act and do things that they weren't always able to do in the movies. So that that began to happen, which was very gratifying indeed. They were never paid anything like the salaries that they got on other shows, on Lux and so forth. We couldn't afford it, and I didn't want to raise things out of proportion to what we had available. This was the beginning of the prestige show of suspense. The next month, on January 13, 1944, Lucille Ball starred in an episode called Dime a Dance. The script was based on a Cornell Woolrich story and adapted by Bob Talman. Talman wrote scripts in a single day with edits done in the hour between rehearsal and broadcast. 32 and a seasoned film actress. In 1944, Ball began to carve out a second career on the radio. She appeared on Duffy's Tavern, Abbott and Costello, and the Screen Guild Theater. In Dime a Dance, she plays a dancer in a hall. A serial killer is targeting young women. Her character, Ginger Allen, gets involved in tracking the killer down. This episode's rating was 8.5. Roughly 6 million people tuned in. For more info on Lucille Ball's radio career, tune into Breaking Walls episode 100. Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud! Uh, your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you the MGM star, Miss Lucille Ball. The suspense play which stars Miss Ball, and which is produced and directed by William Spear, is called Dime a Dance. It deals, as you will presently know, with Broadway life and sudden death, both set to music. And so with Dime a Dance and with the performance of Lucille Ball as a red-haired young lady named Ginger Allen, Roma Wines again hope to keep you in... Suspense. Have you ever danced with a murderer? Doesn't cost any more for the extra thrill. It's only a dime. How could I do it, you say? I had to, to save my own life. I'm a taxi dancer from the Joyland Palace. One of the places just off Broadway in the 40s, you know the kind of place. Second-rate dance bands like Frankie Froman's 15 Frolickers... I was late to work that night. I ran down Broadway, scrambling through the crowd to the entrance of the Joyland. Fifty beautiful girls upstairs, boys. Come in and count them yourself. No admission, ten cents a dance. Come in, we're just getting started. The music is the very... Hello, Max. Hey, uh, Ginger, you better step on them. Marina's looking for you. Your lady's burning. I know it. Has Julie come in yet? Not yet. Fifty beautiful girls waiting to dance. Ah, good evening. So you finally decided to come, did you? Hi, I'm Marino. Sorry I'm late. Yeah, you ought to be, and so should Julie. All the cash customers are waiting. I sent out the girls before all the years are here, and you say I'm playing favorites. Well, blame it on Julie. She gave me a stand-up tonight. All right, so I'll blame it on Julie. Where is she? Isn't she here? No, and she ain't home neither, because I phoned her there 15 minutes ago. I thought she was with you. And I thought she was here. Hey, if this is no gag, what happened to her? Well, that's what I'm beginning to wonder. Hey, go on in and get your stuff on. Julie be all right. Yeah, maybe she slipped in while you were busy counting tickets or something. See you right away, Marino. Thanks for being late and being tedious. 
Duchess pad. We've been entertained by Mom here while waiting for All you. right, lay off. Mom, throw me that foot powder. Looks like a heavy night out there. My feet still hurt from last night. Here you are, dearie. That's the way I am, girlies. But I like every once in a while is the good, juicy murder. Nice kid. No, not to be murdered herself. Throw me that dress, would you, Madame Defarge? The green one. Oh. Is Julie here? Not unless she's hiding in the closet, honey. Do any of you know where she is? You asking us? Ain't she your buddy? Maybe they had a fight. Well, did any of you hear from her? Why not ask Marino? He's been hanging around her. <laughs> now, that southern girl, Sally, she used to work in a joint like this one further uptown. There was a murder for you. Come on, hurry it up in there. Out in the blood, step on it. She just never showed up to work one night. Who didn't? That southern girl, Sally. Then they found her. That was about three years ago. Oh, what a sight she was when the police discovered the body. Oh, cut it out, Mom. Then there was a Robinson gal out in oh. Brooklyn, stabbed to death. They found a phonograph and records by a body didn't even belong to her. The murderer brought his own music. Oh, she was a dance hall pony, too. Maybe some guy has it in for you girls. Pleasant character. Well, maybe one fella kills the both of them. Maybe there's a dance hall killer still at large getting ready for his next victim. Now, what do you think I pay you girls for anyway? I often wonder. <laughs> Joe Marino, think we're giving a free show in here? Ah, uh, you couldn't interest anybody in that chassis of yours even with a set of dishes thrown in. Oh, yeah. All right, all of you, file out. I got something to tell Ginger. Right, great person dead. Uh, come on, get out. Uh, Ginger, what I wanted to see you about, I know, uh, I know, Marino. I put you in a spot. I'll be dressed in a minute, and if you'll ward off those garlic eaters tonight, I'll work twice as hard and make it up to you, honest. No, I'm in no spot, Ginger, but you are. Marino, what's the matter? What's happened? The police want to see you, Ginger. Police? What for? I didn't do anything. I'm sorry, Ginger, but... You, you... Something's happened to Julie. That's what the police want to see you about. Julie's dead. Dead? Murdered. <laughs> Tonight in our suspense theater, death is a dancing thing. Roma Wines is bringing you Lucille Ball, a star of suspense, in the Cornell Woolrich story, Dime a Dance. You have heard the prologue for tonight's tale of suspense. Before we return to the scene of our drama, let me say just this. Few spots on the globe boast the unique and perfect combination of nature's gifts, which makes possible truly good wine. Wine which the whole world can enjoy. But wine experts will tell you that among those fortunate spots, none can surpass the vineyards of our own California. From these renowned California vineyards come Roma wines. Wine so perfect in flavor, so delightful, that they are enjoyed in many countries of the world. To us in America, Roma wines are an everyday treat. For we may buy them at an astonishingly low price, since we pay no import duties or expensive shipping costs. Do you enjoy a delicious tangy sherry? Tomorrow, treat yourself to a glass of Roma California sherry. We're sure you will agree you've never tasted finer. With your first sip, you'll understand why Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Tomorrow, ask your dealer for your favorite type of Roma wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that Roma Wines bring back to our soundstage Miss Lucille Ball in Dime a Dance, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> All the way over in that police car with those two flat feet from homicide, I could see Marino's face when he said, murdered. Poor Marino. We got out and walked up to the third floor of the building, to Julie's room. Marino never said a word. All right, sister, in here. Is, is she, is she still in there? No, you won't have to look at her. Oh. How did it happen? Strangled. Why didn't she yell out? There were plenty of people around. Now look, Ginger, we're asking the question. Oh. Yeah, but since you raise it, we figure the person who could get close enough to kill her was someone she felt safe with. Yeah, she was murdered by someone she trusted, by a friend. Well, I was the only friend she had. Yeah, so they tell us. Unless she had a boyfriend. And who was her boyfriend? Yeah. If she was strangled, where did all the blood come from? Flatfoot didn't answer Marino. 
He shut up all at once, as if he didn't have the heart to tell us the rest of it. His eyes gave him away, though. I got the whole score just following his gaze around the room. First, he looked at the little phonograph. By using bamboo needles, she could play it late at night. Soft, you know, so no one could hear it. The needle was worn down halfway, all, all shredded as though it had been played over and over. Then his eyes wandered to a flat piece of paper that, that had eight or ten shiny new dimes on it. Some had little brown flecks on them. Then his eyes went down to the rug. It was all pleated up in places, especially along the edges, as though something heavy, something, something lifeless had been dragged back and forth over it. You mean he danced with her after he killed her? Gave her a dime a dance even then? Now will you tell us? Who was her boyfriend? Play that record. Maybe she'll remember some guy they both knew who was hipped on the piece. It was the only one he played. You just must wasn't hers. She never had that record. Poor butterfly. She hated it. She couldn't stand it. Someone brought that record here with him. Sure, someone did. Maybe her boyfriend, sort of. It was no boyfriend. It was someone who waited for her in that room in the dark and killed her before she could scream. It was the same madman who killed those two other dance hall girls. He pays a dime a dance. A dime a dance, whether you're alive or dead. Back at the grind. The flat feet let me go. Nobody told me anything. Sometime, when you have nothing better to do, you try dancing with a couple of hundred guys a night, asking yourself each time one of them wraps his arms around you, is this the killer? Has he a knife in his hand behind my back? Say, uh, can I see you a minute? Got a ticket? Yeah, but I don't want to dance, Ginger. I want to talk. Well, it's your dime. Say, how do you know my name? Just happened to? Who are you, anyway? Recognize those two guys leaning against the wall? The two flat feet? And I'm the third. Nick's the name. What about Mer... Uh, about her boyfriend? Relax. We have proof it wasn't her boyfriend and wasn't you. Oh, then you expect him to show up again after what he's done already, huh? We just got the report on those other two girls. They were killed by a maniac who played poor butterfly. Also, the fingerprints in all three cases match. He'll keep it up until we get him. How do you know what he looks like? We don't. We only know he isn't through yet. That's why I was assigned to protect you. Protect me? Yep. Keep my eye on you all night while you work and then take you home right to your door. Now, uh, Marino knows about the other two dicks, but no one knows about me. Fact is, headquarters told me not to tell even you. Then why did you? <laughs> I just saw how touchy you are. I don't want you to misunderstand my attentions. Well, what if someone asks me who you are? I'll say I'm your new boyfriend. Oh, don't get smart. I never had a boyfriend. Good. Now you've got one. Oh, 35 girls on this musical chain gang. Why do you pick on me? Because we found out one more thing about the killer's habits. The two girls that were murdered before Julie both had red hair. And Julie had red hair? Yeah. And so have you, baby. <gasps> So I was set up as victim number four. Nice thought. But every night, like the milkman, just when the girls filed out to feast the arms and eyes of the wolves, there was Nick. Now, that was some comfort. Nothing personal, you understand. It was also a comfort to see those other two flat feet on the job night after night. How's Ginger? Fine. How's Nick? Hey, you're four minutes late. You miss me? Oh, I'm just a taxpayer that wants to see a public servant earn his money. <laughs> if the city got broke, I'd do this job for nothing. Uh-oh. Your straw boss, Marino, is giving you the high sign. Oh, I'll go see what he wants. You wait here. It's on your mind, Marino. Hey, who is that monkey hanging around you every night? Well, he pays for his tickets, doesn't he? Yeah, but he never uses them. Who is he? My boyfriend. Oh. You known him long? Long enough. Take care of yourself, Ginger. Don't worry, Marino. I know my way around, but thanks. Besides, we're not running any matrimonial pure around here. You've got to spread yourself around a little more. Share the wealth. There's other customers. All here. right, all now, right. Now, watch out, will you? All right. 
What the, what did he want? Oh, nothing. Nick, is there any news? You know, it's a month since Julie no, was... No, 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 no. Calm down, redhead. Yeah, that's just it, that red hair. Look, wh- why won't you let me dye it? Oh, I've got my reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You great, big, silent, strong cops. <laughs> that's right. Those cops. <laughs> And then came that night, that horrible night. I was late as usual, got to the dressing room, planning to dress in no seconds flat so I could get out on the floor and be with Nick. Somehow I felt that I was going to need him that night. Some instinct told me it was a matter of life or death. It's been a whole month since the last one. What I like every once in a while is the good, juicy murder. Come on, snap it up. What do you think I'd pay you girls for anyway? Who are you looking out the door for, Ginger? Now, you take that kill in the jewelry. There was a real juicy kill. Oh, shut up, Mom. Will you cut it out? Oh, I'm sorry, dearie. I keep forgetting you and she was so cool. Well, that's all right. I'm jittery. Laverne, have you seen my boyfriend? Not tonight. Maybe he got bored. Billy, have you seen Nick? You know, the tall, handsome... Not tonight, redhead. I guess he's giving you the air. Come uh... on, come on. Oh, what am I paying you for? Come on. Well, what's the matter, Ginger? You look like you've seen a ghost. What are you looking for out there? What's so fascinating about the clock? Marino, they're not there. Where are those two flat feet? Well, how'd you know about that? Never mind that now. Where are they? Called off. Called off? That yeah, sounds screwy to me, but police headquarters figures they frightened off whoever they was looking for. But that's crazy. I'm going to fall... That nah, won't do no good. I told them that anybody would wait till it cooled off before trying again. Now is when we should have protection. Well, come on. Get out on the floor. Come on, Ollie. Out on the floor. All right. I'll be out in a second. Really, I will, Marino. Laverne. Yes, honey? As soon as Nick comes in, tell him to come right here. Tell him to tap on the door, will you? Sure enough, sugar. Hey. What are you looking at me like that for, Ginger? Look, Mom, I got to talk to you. I can't go out there on the floor. I'm scared. But what are you staring holes in me for? Mom, you and I were here in this room the last night Julie was alive. The night she must have been killed, remember? You poor kid. I always Look, like we got to remember. We've just got to. There was someone dancing with Julie that night. Some rum dum. Julie said something about him. I can't remember what it was she said. Oh, you mean the one that hurt her hand? That's it. That's it. Hurt her hand. Bent her wrist back when they were dancing. Yeah, that's the guy. She said it was almost like as if he got a kick out of hurting her. Yeah. Seeing a squirm. Yeah, I know. What else? What else? Well, Julie called him a cement mixer. Oh, now we're getting somewhere, Mom. Think yeah. hard. Oh, he had Julie crazy dancing yeah. like a slap-happy pug. I remember her describing it. He'd take three little steps to the right as if he was getting ready for a standing broad jump. That was it. Remember how Julie said she felt like screaming for Pete's sake, if you're gonna jump, jump. Yeah, three steps to the right, and if you're gonna jump, jump. Hey, what are you doing, Ginger? Some detective work? Getting some clues? You know who we're talking about, Mom? The killer? Yeah. Oh! If he enjoyed hurting her like that, Ma, as when she was still alive, he'd enjoy dancing with her after she was dead. Oh, he's worse than prune face. Why, that... There's someone I gotta tell this to right away. Oh, where the... Nick! See you later, Mom. Hey, that was Ginger. Oh, Nick... How's Nick? Are you trembling? Sure it's me, why not? I thought you were called off the case. We were. Now what are you doing here? Habit. Do you mind? No, you dumb ape, I don't mind. Boy, how I don't mind. And uh, as long as it isn't duty anymore, do you mind if I do something to you that I've wanted to do for days? No, it depends. I want to take you in my arms. All right, take me in your arms and dance. Anyway, for the time being. I'm a rotten dancer. You're telling me. Nick... Nick, we gotta talk. I just found out something about the killer that you ought to know. Later. I paid Marina for all the dances to the end. We can leave whenever you want. After this song, they play Dinah, and then comes the break. We can leave then. What makes it so sure? Well, the band always plays the song in the same order. Then they can sleep while they work. I tell time by them. <laughs> Limehouse Blues means it's 10.45. Lady was a tramp means 11.15. Dinah means 11.30. Never changes except when there's a request number. You know, I like everything about you. I like everything about you, but you're dancing. Let up on my hand, will you? You're bending it upside down. It hurts my wrist. I, uh, told you I was a rotten dancer. Well, for Pete's sake, don't dance like you were priming for a standing broad jump. If you're going to jump, jump. (gasps) That's not Dinah. No, it certainly isn't. It's a request number. Who requested it? I did. (laughs) Mm-hmm. 
What's the matter, baby? I look sick. I, 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 I feel just awful. I, I, I do feel sick. Am I dancing that bad? No, no, I just, I... Nick, I'll have to stop. It's the air, I guess. I'll, I'll go in and get a drink of water. Yeah, I'll drink of water in the ladies' room. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'll wait here for you. I'll just be a minute. Operator. Operator, give me the police department, homicide squad. Police department, homicide, right away. Homicide. Hello, homicide. This is Ginger Allen at Joyland. The third man you assigned to our place is third the... Third man? Uh, what third man? Nick Ballister, the one you assigned to protect me. We have no Nick Ballister, and there was no man assigned by us to protect you. It's the killer. He's taking me out with him. I don't know where to... Look, I'll leave a trail of ticket stubs. Please come quick. Ginger. Uh, uh, goodbye, uh, Katie. I'm sorry you couldn't work tonight. I'll, I'll fix it with Marino. How are you feeling? You shouldn't have come in here, Nick. Didn't you see the sign? All that? Men keep out, violators subject to arrest? <laughs> Didn't say positively. Besides, they wouldn't arrest a cop. Why couldn't you leave me in here alone? You were gone so long, I thought something had happened. Nothing's happened. Yet. <laughs> Don't ask me how, but I kept up a patter while we walked. All my brains were in my right hand that clutched those ticket stubs in my coat pocket. I kept dropping those stubs, making sure he didn't see. I tried to stay on the bright streets, but he led me to the lonely ones. The one we were on now was like a graveyard. No lights, no people. Suddenly, I felt my blood run cold. My fingers in that right-hand pocket fished around like a drowning man clutching for straws. The last ticket stub was gone. Ginger. Yes, Nick? I'm, uh, I'm hungry. Would you like some chub suey? Like it? Oh, I'd love it. He ate that chop suey with an appetite. Like a guy who had work to do. Work he was going to enjoy. I side-sneaked a glance at the jukebox without turning my head, you know, just my eyes. What a relief. All kinds of songs, but no poor butterfly. <laughs> Nick was beginning to act nervous. He'd guzzle a cup of tea, pour another, and keep looking over his shoulder like he was worried somebody might be following us. Then he'd grin like he used to and reach over for my hand. He pressed my fingers till they hurt. Hard, like he'd never pressed them before. I guess... I guess he couldn't wait. And suddenly he stood up. Ask the waiter for the check, Ginger. I'm just going to wash my hands. Then it's time we left. Hmm. Waiter. Waiter, quick. Yes, you mean. What will you be? I'm leaving. When my boyfriend comes out, tell him you think I went back to the, the, the powder room. A <laughs> gag, you know, he's a deadbeat. I want to shake him. Maybe you don't understand. <gasps> Marino, how did you get here? Mom told me, and I followed your ticket stops. He almost saw me. Come on, quick. Marino, thank heaven you got here. Hurry up. <sighs> Marino, I, I can't run anymore. I'm... I won't last the block. Uh, you won't have to. There's a vacant house in the middle of the block. Here. Inside. Fast. I think I see him coming. It's all dark in here. Well, no one lives here. That's why. Here, I'll light this searchlight. There. Mm. There's a stairway leading upstairs. Oh. Go ahead. Now, watch it now. Don't trip. Them yeah. stairs is broken. Mm. There. Mm. Now, through this door. Ooh. Here's a candle and, and a match. Oh. There. Now we can see each other and wait. Do you think we're safe? We'll know in a few minutes. Oh, Marino. Oh, it's him. Shh, put out that candle. Now hide. Back there. I'll take care of him. Ginger. <gasps> Jim. All right, you oh. ask for it. We'll see about that. Who is it? Who, who 
is it? Answer me. Answer me, please. Oh. 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 Why do you call me Muriel? What are you doing? I'm Ginger, don't you remember? I'm Ginger Allen. Yeah, each time you tell me a different name, Muriel. But you can't get away by changing names. Marino! Yeah, the first time you changed your name was when you married me before I left for Europe with that operetta company. You remember? The orchestra played Poor Butterfly no. when you promised to love oh, me forever. Help me. Somebody help yeah, me. Yeah, well, the next time you changed your name was when you thought I was dead. Lived on my insurance and married another man. Oh, no matter how many times please. you change your name, Uriel, I'll find oh. you. <laughs> no, not me. You yeah. killed him. You killed him, Marino, again and again. You only killed her last month, yeah. Marino. Each time I think I have, she rises again. This time I'm going to kill you and your lover. Oh. This is the last time. Oh, Nick! And now we ah. dance. Ah. Now we dance. Ah. Here. Give me your dimes. The Lord, you were going to and now we dance. And then you... How's Ginger? Oh, Nick. Oh, Nick. I thought he killed you. I got an awfully hard head. Police will be here in just a minute. Oh, Nick. How do you fit into this? Headquarters never heard of you. They were instructed to say that in case you called. Well, what was the idea of scaring me to death? Well, I figured Marina would follow Ginger and her boyfriend once he thought the police were off the case, and when he did, I had to have you thinking I was the killer, so you'd run off with him willingly. Why, you no good... It was the only way to find his hideout and the evidence we need. The phonograph, the record, and the attempted murder. At my expense, you big piece of... Uh, another thing. How'd you know about dancing like a broad jumper and turning up my wrist? Oh, I listened outside the door to you and Mom talking about that in the dressing room tonight. Oh. Gave me a couple of neat pointers. Oh. I put them together with poor butterfly so I could scare the daylights out of you. Well, you did, too. I ought to ring your... Oh, calm down. <laughs> no wife of mine is going to have a red-headed temper. Wife of yours. You'll do anything to learn how to dance, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks that way. No wonder you didn't want me to dye my hair. You wanted that nice, premature gray color. <laughs> And so closes Dime a Dance, presented by Roma Wines, and starring Lucille Ball, tonight's tale of Suspense. In just a moment, we'll hear again from Miss Ball. First, though, let's visit a glamorous casino somewhere on the sunny Caribbean. Smartly dressed people stroll about the gardens. The strains of a Cuban song float out. Two men watch from a table on the terrace. One is a Cuban... The other, a North American. Juan is about to propose a toast. To your beautiful country, Jose. I drink to that. Now I propose a toast to this wine in which we drink our toast. It comes from North America, from California. Its name is Roma. Only a few places in the world produce wines so fine that many countries enjoy them. And among these enjoyable wines are Roma wines. For they come from vineyard districts that are among the finest in the world our own sunny California. What better testimonial to the quality of Roma wines could you ask than the fact that Roma wines are made in California for the enjoyment of the world? There is a fine Roma wine for you, whether your taste calls for a sherry, a burgundy, or sauterne. And no matter what type of Roma wine you buy, you know you're receiving a truly fine wine at a price made possible because Roma wines are the overwhelming favorite of Americans. America's largest selling wines. Ask your dealer to show you his assortment of Roma wines tomorrow and choose your favorite. Roma, 
R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Remember, this is the year of decision, and that means that this year, more than ever before, we should all buy more and even more war bonds and stamps. This is Lucille Ball. It's been a great pleasure to appear on Suspense this evening. Next week, I know you want to be listening, as I certainly will, to a very wonderful actor, Mr. Paul Lucas, who will appear in a suspense play called A World of Darkness. Thank you, Miss Ball. Lucille Ball appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Madame Curie. Don't forget, then, next Thursday, same time, for Paul Lucas in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wine. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.